Hi there, Kendra. Thanks for joining us. We're just getting started. So like I said, um, we are so excited to have you here with us this afternoon. Welcome to the NICEWANGA Remote Learning Series. Um, these sessions that uh, we're having for you during these um, four or five weeks um, are created to provide you with the opportunity to extend and refine some of your practices, um, mainly through engaging students in remote or virtual learning. Today we're going to showcase some high impact um, strategies and practices. We'll model those as well. We'll share some resources with you. And we're also going to highlight some ways to facilitate effective remote learning. But we also want you to know that even though these resources and strategies are modeled for remote learning, you're also going to be able to implement them into your in-person classrooms, that brick and mortar building, if we return, when we return. I am Brandi Wilson and co-presenting with me today is Christy Snyder. Again, we are both instructional coaches with Nice Longer Foundation. All right, welcome. Um, I'll take just a few minutes to talk about Zoom. Um, some of us are familiar with Zoom, probably more so than we ever thought we would be. Um, but in case you're fairly new to Zoom, we will talk about just a couple of these tools. First of all, along the bottom, you'll notice your um, video and microphone options. We would love to see your faces. I think some of you are letting us see your faces. Thank you for that. Um, I know it's awkward, but it really helps to warm up this rather sterile environment if we can see you. So if you're able to do so, please, please um, turn on your video. You also have the option to be muted or not. We do ask that you keep yourself muted just to keep down on the background noise, um, but please feel free to unmute uh, if you have a comment or a question. And speaking of questions and comments, um, we'll look at this little chat bubble in the middle of your Zoom bar. If you click that, it should open up a chat pane to the side. Um, feel free at any time to chat questions and make comments. We'll be putting some important information there for you as well. So if you could open up that chat pane, it would help you out a lot. Um, when I share my screen, it usually forces you into full screen mode. If that's not working for you, please feel free to uh, just hit the escape button on your computer and that will exit you out of full screen mode. And then you'll see your participant window. Mine's kind of to the side, but uh, wherever yours is, just feel free to minimize or maximize that uh, in whatever way works best for you. All right, when Brandy and I set out on this journey, Nicewanger had asked us to create some PD sessions that kind of um, were encompassed like a, a learning arc. And we were um, dedicated to finding a framework for these four sessions. And so what we did was we, we noticed this article, Achieving the Vision of This We Believe from AMLE. And this is their AMLE, the Association of Middle Level Education. This is their foundational um, document. And um, what it does is it posits that education for young adolescents should have four central attributes. It should be developmentally responsive. It should be challenging, empowering, and equitable. Uh, and in our session last week, we talked about um, develop, being developmentally responsive. And today we'll be talking about challenging. We hope that you will join us for our next two sessions. They're gonna be the next two Tuesday afternoons from 345 to 445. And we will end with a deep dive session toward the end of September. Um, but each of these sessions will be grounded in building community and relationships in a virtual setting. Today, we will focus on session two, um, challenging. Hey, Christy, the part of the set, the part of the slide is blocked out. I don't know if we need to refresh the slides or it's like it's grayed but, out or something. On every slide? Is it, could it be, does that help? You, there, that did help, but there's something else blocking it as well. Your mouse is right on it. So that's my, that's my um, 
my participant window. So I guess I just need to close that. Is that better? Yes. Okay, how strange. So All you do right. <clears throat> I don't need to reflect, refresh the slides? Nope, I think you're good now, it's clear. Okay, great, thank you for letting me know. All right, what are we aiming to do today? In this session, you're gonna gain an understanding of how to support those virtual learners um, while still challenging them. And um, we're also gonna focus on active rather than passive learning in the virtual classroom to prepare students to grasp those complex ideas we're hoping um, that they retain. And specifically today, we're gonna be focusing on the use of Nearpod. But before we get started, we would like for you to take our poll to determine your level of experience with active learning. So Brandy is dropping a link to the poll in the chat. You'll have two ways in which to participate in this poll. You may either go to www.pollev.com slash Christy Snyder 197 or you can text Christy Snyder 197 to 2233. Just do that once to join and then text A, B, C, or D. You may access the poll now. I love seeing those answers come in. So it looks like the vast majority of us um, are aware of active learning online, but they haven't used it much in their courses. All righty, thank you. All right, so back to the AMLE uh, article. AMLE states that an essential attribute of successful schools is that education must be challenging. Uh, young adolescents are rapidly uh, developing intellectually and they are increasingly prepared to grasp more and more complex ideas. And adolescent development is not accomplished alone. It's supported by the structure of the learning environment and also by knowledgeable educators. So schools must not only meet the uh, students where they are developmentally, which is what we talked about last week, if you were with us, but they must also challenge them to uh, develop further. Administrators and teachers must hold high expectations for what students can do and then create opportunities for them to push themselves through productive struggle essentially raising the bar for their intellectual development. And active learning is central to raising this bar. With active learning, teachers challenge students to make decisions about their own learning. Now I'd like to draw your attention to this learning pyramid here. Um, I know that naturally we want to read these pyramids from the bottom up, but I would encourage you to look at it from the top down um, again, this is measuring the average retention rate after 24 hours. And you'll notice at the top, you've got an average retention rate for lecture at 5% after 24 hours. So not very effective at all. But as you come down this pyramid and you um, begin to see more and more active learning strategies being used, like practice by doing and teaching others, the retention rate really increases 75 to 95%. So even though we have this research, active learning doesn't always happen in today's classroom. What I typically see in classrooms is students doing things like uh, reciting the five freedoms protected in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, or maybe multiplying numbers in scientific notation. Students know the differences between connotation and denotation, as well as the differences among alleles, genes, and chromosomes. These are curriculum elements 
that have been explained kind of from the front of the room or maybe recorded on a virtual platform um, or about which students have read or viewed media. Most students simply record the information in their notebooks or maybe in their personal technology. They quiz themselves on it close to test time and then they echo it back on the unit test. And because teachers are so pressed for time to cover all our standards, if those students get a decent grade, they count this as successful learning and then they move on to the next unit. But I would ask you to consider, is that really successful learning? I, I think not. Um, in each of those examples that I shared, learners were passive consumers, not active creators. So what is active learning? Let's watch the video to learn more. When I think of active learning, I think of students co-constructing knowledge with me in some way. Um, that could be a project, it could be around a discussion, it could be a fishbowl. When I see a classroom where students are talking more to each other than listening to the professor, that to me is active learning. Active learning involves creating and constructing artifacts, such as a drawing or a painting or a, a sculpture. If you're in a performing arts, active learning is a performance. I get to be creative here, and I get to develop new things and new activities, and even things with real life like paper and scissors, and having students construct and build and perform. Active learning is as much figuring out what the questions are as it is figuring out what the answers to those questions are. In fact, the questions are far more important than the answers. Choosing meaningful activities or questions is at the heart of what makes active learning effective. We need to ask them questions that offer opportunities for meaningful thinking. Active learning is the only thing I do these days. I, have, I don't lecture if I can help it. When I think back to my college experience, the only courses I remember are the very few that I had that incorporated active learning. Looking back 10 or 15 years later, I'm thinking, I wish I'd had more of that. All right. So active learning is a student-centered approach in which the responsibility for learning is placed on, upon the student. Um, and they're often working in collaboration with their classmates. In active learning, teachers are facilitators rather than just one-way providers of information. The presentation of facts through lecture is de-emphasized in favor of more active instructional strategies like those that you see here on this graphic. A common assumption of active learning is that it must be done face-to-face but that's not true. In just a minute, Brandy is gonna model for you some active learning strategies that you could easily implement in your classroom, whether virtually or in person. But first, uh, let's reflect on what you've learned about active learning so far. Please choose to respond to one of these three questions. What connection can you make between a new idea from the video and your prior knowledge? What new ideas can you get from anything presented so far that extended or pushed your thinking in new directions? Or what is challenging or confusing for you? We'd like to ask you to share your response either in the chat or by unmuting. And since I can't see the chat, I hope some of you will unmute. <laughs> um, and we're going to give you 30 seconds to respond. And I think this will count down before our 30 seconds officially start. Christy, you make me feel like I'm in a game show. And speaking of connecting this to my prior knowledge, I would just like to say, um, I don't know about you folks, but when I look back on my elementary middle school career, that's exactly how I studied. Exactly. Just study it, memorize it, regurgitate it, and forget it after a week. Me too. All right, did we get any responses in the yes, chat? Yes, we did. Um, 
When the one lady said that she can remember only the college courses that had active learning, I thought about my college experience and it was the same. So that echoed deep with Kara and understood. I can connect some of these ideas to a prior PD I went to. Students have to ask the questions and figure out the answers on their own. The teacher is just there to guide the students if they get off track um, from the nippers. I completely agree with that. And I think that students should be doing the heavy lifting. And that's what Christy and I are sharing here in active learning. All right, thank you so much for that participation. All right, in that video that Christy shared, um, we saw um, educators present ways that they're using active learning within their classrooms. And we also saw some additional strategies on that active learning continuum graphic. So how about we examine a few of those just a bit more closely. Now we're gonna be utilizing Nearpod as our platform to practice a few of these with you. Um, and if you're not familiar with Nearpod, this tool lends itself well to engaging your learner especially online when you're dealing with those students that will be meeting both synchronously and asynchronously. Um, it's also helpful in building relationships and community within your learning environment because then you're able to um, have students collaborate, team up, or pair up. And though we're not gonna see all the amazing ways that you can use Nearpod today due to our time constraints, um, I am gonna have someone drop a link in the chat this is from one of our summer sessions that another Nice Wonder coach presented. Um, so a shameless plug there, but it, it will fill you in um, on all of the Nearpod goodness. Now, Christy and I are working on the assumption that you are either brand new to Nearpod, have never heard of it, or you're a possible novice and you've played around a bit. So before we get started, we're gonna show a short video. And this video is gonna offer a little more insight into the online tool reference some of its capabilities um, and show you some of the tools that you're able to use. We would also like you to keep in mind what Kurt Lewin has shared here, folks, that learning is more effective when it is an active rather than a passive process. Introducing Nearpod, an award-winning student engagement platform that comes with thousands of ready-to-run interactive K-12 lessons. Nearpod is a platform that easily allows teachers to create, download, and teach interactive lessons across all student devices, including Chromebooks, iPads, iPhones, and Android devices. Teachers can easily upload their existing PowerPoints, PDFs, Google Slides, and Sways, and convert them into interactive Nearpod lessons by adding engaging activities like quizzes, polls, draw it, open-ended questions, fill-in-the-blanks, games, and 3D objects. With Nearpod VR, teachers can take their students on a virtual field trip anywhere in the world. Teachers launch a live lesson. Students enter a lesson code and the lesson is synced to all student devices. Teachers can also launch student-paced lessons, which allow students to complete a lesson on their own time, wherever they are. Teachers get real-time feedback on student understanding and can access post-lesson reports to assess individual and class performance. Nearpod also has a library of thousands of ready-to-run, standards-aligned K-12 lessons across all subjects from a curated list of trusted publishers. All lessons are editable and customizable to meet the needs of individual teachers and students. Nearpod is the most comprehensive student engagement platform that your students will love. All right, um, in the video, that narrator referenced Nearpod as a student engagement tool, which is one of the key factors of active learning. Um, I love its accessibility, um, how it's supported on most platforms, and it's also available on most devices. Um, you can create student-paced lessons where those asynchronous students can link up with you and still be able to participate. I love, one of my favorite things is that real-time, immediate feedback piece um, that's embedded in that platform. So folks, let's get started. Um, we're gonna practice a few of these strategies and I just wanna say, hold on and buckle up because it's gonna be a quick ride. Um, Christy's gonna drop the link to our Nearpod presentation in the chat box. Folks, please note that you may have to minimize our Zoom tab for now and just open up a new browser tab and type in join.nearpod.com. 
And then the code today will also be in the chat box, but it is all caps, E, K, M, X, I. If you're having any problems getting on, please let us know. You can unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. I can't click the link to go to it. Um, you may just have to copy and paste that in your address bar. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, I'm working on the assumption that we're all in. Can I get a thumbs up or down? All right, we're gonna be moving on. So welcome to the Nearpod for building community and relationships in a virtual setting while still challenging those students. So what is your experience with Nearpod? Are you a novice? You've never used it before. Um, I'm sorry, you've never used it before or a novice. Um, the lady across the hall has uh, introduced you to it and asked you to give it one go around. Um, are you a pro? Where are you on your use of Nearpod. Now, as you're answering, I want you to note that as a presenter, you're able to see all your participants' responses on your page. Okay, within that 15 seconds, it looks like most of us are unfamiliar with Nearpod. So that's awesome. We hope that you're able to join Brooks um, session on the use of Nearpod because I think you'll really enjoy this tool in your classroom. All right, let's keep trucking. If you look, this slide is showing you a different layout. Um, notice how those active learning strategy slides are over here to the left. Um, as a participant, you're able to click through those at your leisure. Um, as the teacher, you can have um, them go along with you or you can have them say offer 15 minutes to read the slides. You see we have the pause procedure here, the retrieval practice, strip sequence, which we will practice, and also the minute papers, which we will practice today. Also, think, pair, share is an active learning strategy that Christy will be doing with us in reflection. So on this slide, you see an active learning cheat sheet, and you see those 10 steps there that help get you started. So after we see these active learning strategies, what are our next steps? What do we do? Which strategies do we use? How do we know what to choose? On this, we would normally give you lots more time, but due to our 30 minute time constraints, I would like you to take one minute to read this manila rectangle box over on the left hand side that says the 10 steps to getting started. Again, we would normally give you more time, but one minute will be sufficient enough for the activity that we're going to introduce. Christy, can you start a timer for us, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You guys go ahead and get reading. About 15 seconds. Okay. All right, thanks 
so much for participating and reading that article, or uh, cheat sheet actually. And like I said, we would normally give students more time to interact with a piece of text, but to honor our stop time today, we are going to move on. And though we won't have enough time to complete all the activities, know folks that this is just to get those creative juices flowing and come up with some, for you to be able to come up with some ideas of your own, how to implement this in the classroom. If you'll notice here, we are in a Google slide that I have just embedded into the Nearpod. The directions say, please choose a slide that no one else is working on. Please place the planning steps from the active learning sheet in order on your slide. And then the active learning sheet is also linked on the slides. We say choose a, um, write your name in there because if you're working with a group, you can claim it. You can state claim to that slide. That way no one else is working on that slide and it is just you. Um, in the classroom, I would like this to be a group activity, um, but for time purposes today, we're just going to do this individually just so you'll have an opportunity to manipulate the slide. But notice here are the 10 steps on the cheat sheet, and then you will just move those around. Feel free to do so for just a moment. You may claim a slide and practice. And again, this is the strip sequence activity. I see everyone in those slides making moves. And again, just another way to get those students engaged. Okay, we're gonna move on again due to time constraints. On this page quickly, it is another opportunity to practice that strip sequencing um, by pairing. Um, and again, that is an activity offered within Nearpod. You choose a card um, and then the accompany description. So like a number one with the first step. Again, I know that was quick. Like I said, hold on, it's a roller coaster ride. So after having completed our versions, um, since we showed two, of the strip sequence strategy, how do you guys see yourself implementing that into your own classrooms? We're gonna practice the one minute active learning strategy now, and we would like you to take, just like it says, one minute to write your response on this collaboration board. Notice, on the bottom of your screen, it says share thoughts and or images here. For one minute, we would like you to write your response to the question, which is at the top, and it'll automatically put it on a post-it note on the board. And then if you'd like to add an image, you can. Also, after your participant uh, friends have posted, you're able to like their comments. So Ms. Christie is going to set a timer for us. Guys, we may go five minutes over, but we won't keep you longer than that, I promise. <laughs> And you can get started. Yes, I love the timeline idea as a middle school social studies teacher, um, them to be able to manipulate and make meaning would be great. Ten Elizabeth, if, go ahead, Christy. I was just saying 10 seconds. Elizabeth, I love your response and you're not how not sure how you could use it with your caseload, but if you have different age students in your classroom at the same time, you could almost do Nearpod lessons um, to activate those students and make sure that they're engaged um, and have different grade levels on different Nearpods. Okay. So that I would See what I'm saying? Like okay. you could have a kindergarten lesson, maybe a second grade lesson. And they could go through on their own. You don't have to facilitate it for oh, them. And they could use it on like an iPad, a tablet, because they can manipulate those for the yes, most part. Yes, ma'am. can manipulate those for the most part. Okay. You sure can. I think it would be a great use. Hey, and I'll add, Brandy, that 
Um, I believe Nearpod will let you duplicate uh, a lesson. So if you had like a standard that may be built on itself across several grades, you could maybe start with a particular concept and then just modify it depending on what grade level mm -hmm. the student is. So you wouldn't be creating out, everything from scratch. <laughs> I was gonna say cut out some of that work. But yes, I definitely think it could accommodate your kiddos. All right, folks, that concludes the Nearpod. And again, I know that was quick. So if you, you can leave it open in your browser if you would like. The materials for this, screenshots of this will be available on our materials page within the website. Um, but we are now gonna turn it back over to Christy for our wrap up. All right, so just very quickly, we're gonna uh, reflect on our time together today using a think, pair, share active learning strategy. First, decide to what question you would like to respond uh, and then think about your response for just a second. Brandy is going to assign you a buddy from the chat with whom to pair up and share your response. And if you've never chatted privately, um, what you'll do is you'll open your chat pane and then at the very bottom where you can type your message, you'll see everyone is usually the default unless you've privately messaged someone already in, uh, during today's presentation. So you can just pull that down and change uh, the name to whomever it is that Brandy assigns you. Christy and Bethany, if you'll chat. The Nippers and Elizabeth Chapel, if you'll chat. Um, let's see, Kara, if you'll chat with Catherine, if she's available. All right, for sake of time, I'm gonna rush us through this, but would anybody like to share what you and your buddy came up with? I love the utilizing active learning in the classroom um, because it builds that community because you pair up. You, students are talking to one another. They're doing the heavy lifting, coming up with the questions, answering the questions, rather than just um, regurgitating information. My own children are virtual learners right now. And um, this building of community and relationships, I am seeing firsthand how extremely valuable that is to these mm. learners. It is just a piece that um, is desperately needed and anything you can do to get these kids, you know, active and, and talking with one another is, is, I just cannot tell you how beneficial it is. Hey, right. Christy, I appreciated that continuum chart and just thought, hey, if I could print that out and have it next to me while I'm thinking about planning a lesson, just incorporating one strategy and thinking about where it falls on that continuum and over the course of a week, you know, um, trying to pull some strategies off different places off of that continuum could be helpful. And some of them are probably things you're already doing. All right. Um, Randy? We just want to um, re refresh in this speedy quick presentation some of the ways that we modeled active learning you will see there today and also it lends itself well to personalization for students which um, Elizabeth could be beneficial to you using that Nearpod piece in your um, K-5 to blended classroom. We'll give you just another quick plug for um, joining us for the remainder of our mini sessions next week for empowering and then the following week on equitable and then our deep dive uh, later in September. I would also like to remind you that you can um, access our materials from this presentation on our website. 
Thank and we would love to take for you to take a moment to do our one minute survey guys it's really quick we love feedback and would love for you to reflect um, about the session we want to hear um, ways that you would uh, or actually topics maybe that you would like us to share in later um, professional learning opportunities so again we're always growing and learning and would thoroughly appreciate that Bethany, well, we have had a question about um, getting a certificate. Could you speak to that, please? I can. Um, we're not offering uh, certificates for these sessions, but if you will, um, in, in essence, what we're thinking and what we've heard from school leaders is that they're kind of making those determinations on their own, how they want to award those. But if at any time you need us to you know, send any information about these sessions to your principal or, or just help coordinate, um, you know, that discussion with your, your principal or a, or a district leader, just reach out to me. I'll drop my email in the chat um, and we can help you uh, coordinate and have that conversation with your individual principal or district folks. In the chat, I have dropped the materials link and then also the, um, the evaluation link. So all that's there for you as well, but I'll drop my email there now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this does mark the end of our presentation. We would like um, you to feel free to sign off if you need to do that, but you're also welcome to stay on with us for a continued conversation about building community and relationships in regard to supporting virtual learning that challenges students. Uh, in this conversation, we're gonna focus on um, kind of what is in our sphere of control and what we can do best to support each other and our students. We also want this conversation to be action oriented and practical. And we want to give you space to share what's working well for you in regard to building community and relationships to support a challenging virtual classroom and also what isn't working. You're welcome to share resources as well as insights about what else you would like to learn, um, maybe in that deep dive session or um, you know, just anything you would like to share with us. To get us started, we are going to use the following questions to kind of guide our conversation. The first one is, what's the difference in a compliant and an engaged learner? And the second is, to what extent do staff, school staff members save students from having to struggle? And Brandy and I don't have any preconceived notions about which questions should be first. And you may want to talk about something entirely different, but um, if nobody had anything to say, we just wanted to have some questions there that we could fall back on. And please note that this is a relaxed and formal environment. We would love that free conversation um, for you to share ideas and just to be with other professionals and learn and grow from one another. So if you have anything to share, um, feel free to do so in the chat or unmute yourself. Well, I think a lot of times when you look at a compliant versus an engaged learner, you can see it with answers. A compliant learner would put like the minimal that, hey, I got this part, but engaged would kind of go beyond and go to the next step. Absolutely. The compliant student is looking for simple answers uh, to complex questions and the engaged learner, they're going down different rabbit holes and they're they're trying to find as much information as they, as they can. Great point. I automatically think about that visual of seeing a student looking right at you, shaking their head, nodding in agreeance, um, being so compliant, but they have absolutely no clue what's going on. They're not engaged. They're thinking about the beach, their ball game, whatever it may be. But they look like they're engaged, and we're under the notion that they are until it comes time for those um, questions to be answered or for classroom discussions. And then you're like, wait a second. <laughs> they're like these, you know, bad karaoke singers. They're just lip syncing their way, you know. They're um, just... They're, they're probably bored because they haven't been challenged and, you know, they're just kind of doing the bare minimum. 
I think too, when I think about compliant versus engaged, I think about um, our Tennessee team teaching rubric. And I think about um, having those engaged learners and what that looks like. And the, you know, when you think about compliant versus engaged, what are those small things that I can do to accommodate those learning styles of the different students? Um, and I think that active learning um, lends itself well to that because you have think, pair, share, or you have um, opportunities where students can get up and move. You have riding opportunities. So you're able to meet those needs of those students. So maybe they don't get bored as Christy said, or they're not spacing out like we talked about earlier. And you kind of give them space to explore what it is they're interested in and not just as a teacher dictate every, you know, thing that happens, but give them some room to explore and, um, you know, ask, find the answers to questions that they're interested in within standards. I mean, we, we still have to focus on standards. I understand that, but it just makes all the difference. So I think about, um, to what extent do school staff members save students from having to struggle? I automatically get tickled, Chrissy, and think about when we're in Zoom meetings and the wait time is much oh. more awkward and feels so much longer than it does in the classroom. And so I want to say, talk. Because I don't want to give them that wait time. I just want to just answer it for you. Like Feel that dead space. Like eternity. <laughs> So, you know, virtual learning, you really got to think about that way. And those collaboration boards, I love that because it takes that awkwardness out of it. So they're able to answer that way and giving them choice too, like answer on the collaboration board or answer in the chat or verbalize that. Yeah, I really think we have to trust that, you know, whatever age student we're teaching, you know, they are able to do hard things. And when we instill that trust in them, they really do rise to the occasion. They, they live up to our expectations. So I just think it's really important that we set those expectations high, maybe even higher than what we think they could, you know, maybe do. But they, they typically do rise to the occasion. It's just kind of interesting to think about, to me anyway, that we really do have to struggle to learn. Oh, yes. But they don't like it. Kids don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it's it either. That's why we want to save them because we don't want, you know, there's that thin line between productive struggle and then it's just too hard. But that's our jobs as professionals and educators to find that perfect balance there. <clears throat> but they're constructing knowledge and they're making meaning when they're, you know, working hard and really struggling through, um, you know, if we give them the opportunity to do that. I have to have a conversation with all my classes at the beginning of the year talking about productive struggle and how if I hand you an assignment and within the first two minutes you're asking me for help, no, you, you, haven't, you haven't gone through all of your avenues mm -hmm. yet. You haven't thought about this enough. You're just wanting to get it done. So I kind of make them give them more time before they can ask me a question. And that's even another opportunity to engage in conversation with a peer, if that's something you allow in your classroom. And um, those peer conversations are part of active learning strategy too. And of course you wanna set those up in the beginning of the year um, with uh, directions on how to carry out those conversations and maybe even conversation stems. But the fact that that's a possibility, maybe they just need something to get jump started. But yes, there is, um, something to say for productive struggle. Mm -hmm. And I tell them that too. I tell them, you know, you're not always going to have somebody there to give you an answer. Sometimes you're just going to have to take the risk and try it, even if it is wrong, because you're going to be the only one making a decision. Mm -hmm. I say, you cannot just throw your hands up in the air and quit. You have to figure these things out. Yep. <laughs> I say that to my own kids too. <laughs> <sighs> do they say it back? I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh yeah, they do. Absolutely. Not, not to me, but you know, they, they parrot that back to other people. So I know it's sinking in there somewhere. <laughs> One of the things I used to love to show my students was the research that shows brain imaging of what your brain looks like when it's right versus wrong. 
and how there's so much more active happening in your brain when you are wrong and then you're provided with this information that challenges what you thought. And then there's that space for getting to the eventual uh, right answer and not that right answer, like there's only one right answer, but right. getting to the actual learning that you're intending for the lesson. Uh, and so anytime they would struggle, I would be like, who cares if you're wrong? It just means your brain's working, you know, and just think about all that part of your brain that's lighting up right now that wouldn't have been otherwise. So, you know, go for it, be wrong. Who cares? That's why you're in school to learn. Yeah. Anything that anybody would like to share? Anything that you would like to see um, show up in that deep dive session from these four posits? Developmentally responsive, challenging, engaging, equitable? Any resources you'd like to share? We haven't started back to school yet, so it's kind of hard for me to think about you know, things to need yet, because I haven't quite been in there mm -hmm. to experience it. So I'm just kind of taking everything in, trying to see, well, maybe how could this work if this situation arises or this one or, you know, all of those. Who's your administrator? Uh, Ricky Witt at Metaview Middle School. Metaview, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking you were at Churchill, I'm sorry. Mm -mm, no, I'm at Metaview, it's in Morristown. Okay. Are you all starting in September, I think? We maybe? are, we go back September 2nd, and then the students are coming back on the 8th. And right now we're doing a hybrid model. So we'll be teaching in the classroom, but at the same time, we'll also have whoever in our class has signed up for virtual, we'll also be teaching them as well. So I'm trying to figure out how to do this kind of in a hybrid setting and how I'm going to monitor a classroom and the online setting at the same time. I think that's kind of one of my biggest concerns right now is how do I monitor both the screen but then be present in the room. Yes, that is difficult. And there's a lot being asked of us, but just like Christy said, they raise those expectations and as educators, we always rise to the occasion. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Never want you to feel like you're alone. Um, and that's why sessions like um, these are offered because, you know, it's our job to partner with one another and to help one another and find best practices to use, even in these tough, tricky situations. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one awesome thing that you could do um, is Nearpod. I think if you're online and in class, mm -hmm. because everyone can follow along with you if they're joining synchronously. Now so that's Padlet. Roll it. Yeah. Will that go well, that Nearpod? Will that mesh with Google Classroom? That's what we're yeah. going to be teaching under. So you would just kind of add that, as, I guess, as a link within the class and then just go through the lesson. And um, Bethany or Christy, you may be able to speak to this. Did Brooke discuss that in the Nearpod training? I think she mostly... Um talked about helping folks get acquainted just with the, the application itself. But I know it does, I know Nearpod does work well with Google. In uh -huh. fact, if you've got lessons uh, in Google Slides, for example, uh -huh. there's even an add-on that kind of a like their word for it is to Nearpodize your lesson and you can literally turn your Google Slides directly into a Nearpod. And okay. then all you're doing is adding in um, like the activity options that show up in Nearpod within different segments of your lesson. So maybe you've got a couple slides and then you want to insert an active learning strategy. Okay. Uh, you could just add in whatever that activity is under uh, Nearpod directly okay. into your slides. And, oh, my question left me. You think about it, I want to tell her one thing. Okay. I am in Jefferson County. Okay. And three virtual learners here. And they are not doing a hybrid model. And my, my own children, they just feel really disconnected. And I wish that we had a hybrid model. So I know it's, it's going to be a learning curve. Right. Um, but I really do think that you will reap the benefits of the hybrid model with your students. Because mm -hmm. you're still going to be their teacher of record, even yeah. though they're virtual. 
uh, or distance learners, but I really, I think it, it would be so much better. I wish that Jefferson County had chosen a hybrid model. See, I think it's interesting to see what all the different counties are doing and how they are so different. You know, it's like, I think that, of course, I mean, I know there's a lot of different data with different counties and stuff and yeah, all of that, but. Yeah, I just added a couple links in the chat. Um, okay. One of them was a blog from Nearpod that talks about uh, for our Google Classroom users. Okay. Uh, they kind of ran together. The links kind of ran together in the chat. I uh, see it. That, but, um, and then the other one, I think very similarly, just kind of walks through how they're connected. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for interacting with us. Well, thank you all for doing these. I found them really helpful. I think this is the third one I've gone to. <laughs> I did two of them last week. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed this. We're so happy to have you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any last minute questions or resources to share? All right, well again, we're so happy to have you. We hope to see you in some of the next sessions, so come join us. Um, also, the um, if it helps, that Nearpod session offered by Brooke mm -hmm. may be beneficial to you, especially okay. since you're in school. You have some time still to get ready. Yeah. And that's you, a blessing, actually. It, it really is. Did you see that link I added earlier uh, to get to that uh, session from Brooke, from the... Uh, from this summer. Let's see, I can, I'll redrop it just so you don't have to go okay. digging for it. But, and it'll take you to the materials page for June 22nd. Okay. And then you can just scroll down. I think it was the last session of the day. So it's toward the bottom. Okay. Okay. Thank so Brooke you. pulled all sorts of stuff together and, and she walks through. Um, you can kind of see some of the teacher facing side of Nearpod, so that's pretty interesting. And then there were lots of resources that she talked about. Um, okay. That could be a good, a good starting place. Excellent. Thank you. You're so welcome. Oh, let's see. All right. Well, that concludes our session. All right. We look forward to seeing you in three more. Yes. <laughs> I'm planning on it. <laughs> or even more, girl. You'll be tired of us. <laughs> Thank you again. Y'all have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. <gasps> Woohoo! We saw faces. Oh, Christy left us. Did I have two passes? Yeah. Did I have two No, no, no. I felt like it was good. I'm telling Christy to come back. Come back. Yeah, we come back for a minute. Come back. Okay. okay.